As we approach 2015, we should be mindful of the end of one of the greatest wars and catastrophes that Britain and Europe had to endure. It lasted 23 years and cost Britain and Europe dearly with a loss of millions of lives and countless amounts of suffering among servicemen and civilians. Yet this iconic period is barely covered at all in the classroom and history studies, and it's not on the national curriculum. So Waterloo 200 is the officially recognized body that's been set up to coordinate and network the commemoration of the end of this enormous war. My name is uh, Michael Crumplin and uh, I'm a retired general surgeon who lives in North Wales and uh, since retirement I've taken on the interests of, of medical aspects of the Napoleonic and French Republican Wars. My interest in this period personally started about 50 years ago when fascinated by an era of revolution, of change, of surging industry and military development and colonization um, made me realize that there was a great omission in this period of history and that was to deal with the medical aspects uh, of the campaigns and the war the provision of doctors and how they were trained how men with wounds were treated and what sort of diseases ravaged armies and it soon unfolded that there was a vast area of uncharted territory here. The balance of power in Europe was obviously um, disrupted by the French Revolution because the monarch and his wife had been decapitated along with uh, over a thousand noblemen in Paris alone the bloody French Revolution destabilized Europe and frightened monarchies. This was the great building of power in, in France and it surged through Europe to form an empire that held Spain and Poland uh, and Saxony and Russia and parts of Scandinavia. So this was a natural fear that Britain might get invaded amongst other countries which did get invaded and we had to resist that by mobilizing the land forces and maintaining a very strong navy, as we did. Well, if we look back over this 23-year uh, war, what we can see is that there seems to be a fairly steady ratio uh, of deaths. And by and large, uh, over, if you take 100 men who die in a campaign, about 80 will die of disease and 20 will die on land of combat injury, of small arms fire, cannon fire, or um, uh, death from edge weapon injuries. Perhaps the most feared weapons used during this time were the large lumps of iron employed by the Royal Navy or British Army, or the French equivalents. The amount of kinetic energy as they were fired from the gun was enormous, and if you tried to stop one because you could see them coming towards you because the velocity is quite slow uh, they this would take your leg off these weapons cause devastating injuries they decapitate or cut a body in half or take down a, a file of anything between five and twenty men from one missile this is a an edged weapon it's a curved cavalry saber belonging to the light cavalry of the french grand army these weapons were wielded from high up on a 14, 15 or 16 hand horse and therefore as a cavalry body, for instance, attacked either another cavalry unit or infantry, uh, the blows would fall mainly around the head, neck, shoulders and arms on their opponents. But a lot of the injuries uh, were inflicted by um, cutting down on the enemy. These were relatively easy to treat because they either killed you or um, sliced into the body and therefore these injuries could be bandaged or sewn up uh, and so on. This is um, 
a Baker rifle, which is a, a muzzle-loading uh, black powder weapon that has rifling in its barrel, which increases its accuracy about threefold. Therefore, it was used by sharpshooters to pick off uh, important or leading figures in an advancing enemy force. By and large, it worked by placing a little black powder in this pan here and then closing the uh, frizzen over it and then the musket was tipped on end and black powder was put down the barrel along with the ball which was tapped down. And then as the musket fired, a spark was created which ignited the black powder in the pan and the uh, weapon explodes. Injuries caused by this would have an entry wound and if at close quarters would go right through the body or take pieces of bone out of the body or cause blood and air to escape into the lungs or bleeding or infection into the cavity of the abdomen. And these wounds were often fatal. Where men survived was in injuries of the limb with these sort of weapons. And uh, uh, about 75% of injuries presenting to surgeons were of the arms or legs, and they were totally survivable injuries, although, of course, many of them did die from infection with relatively straightforward operations. You just simply cannot imagine what uh, a post-combat battlefield must have felt like to an observer or somebody lying out suffering on the field. We forget the thousands of horses that are injured and disemboweled, men not getting any water to drink because thirst is a huge problem after injury for various reasons, men crying out for help or death. And uh, within, for instance, the Battle of Waterloo, which was a strange battle because it was a large number of people combating in a relatively small area of two and a half, three square miles. And at the end of the four campaign battles of Waterloo, the medical profession had 62,500 injured men to treat. And if you can imagine these lying out on the field overnight, some of them not being picked up for several days and dying of blood loss and in pain. And the great fear on the battlefield was the sense of loneliness and there was no one there to help you and you were going to die, even being murdered by um, friendly soldiers creeping over the battlefield to steal your teeth or your money or your epaulets or whatever. So I think loneliness, pain and hopelessness were a common identical problem for both French and British combatants when they were hurt on a battlefield. So really what we're doing is leading up to a period where there was complete misunderstanding, there was no way of keeping men comfortable, there was no understanding of the disordered functions of the body in combat or disease. Sanitation and public health and medical care was very primitive and we were just waiting for uh, such big developments as anaesthesia and Pasteur's identification of bacteria to emerge. It's interesting that when we read of soldiers or non-commissioned officers or even officers in the British Army who are not medically trained witnessing the practice of surgery without anaesthesia on patients who struggle and scream and indeed of course it's difficult for the doctor as well as the patient and it's, it's no wonder that there are bitter accounts of the, of the bloody shambles especially with vast numbers of patients being admitted after combat. So I think the greatest medical school there was, was on the battlefield. So what operations could be carried out? Well, if your arm was smashed or your leg was severely damaged, when there was a lot of bone damage, excessive bleeding or soft tissue damage or a big joint was destroyed, the indication was to do an amputation. If you delayed the amputation, the patient would die of uh, a shock, and sepsis. And if you did it too soon, you had to be careful that the patient was strong enough to withstand the operation. So there was usually uh, an hour or two before surgery would be carried out after recovery. And this gave the time for the bleeding to be controlled, the wound to be bandaged. And then the patient, without any form of anaesthetic or alcohol, was placed usually in the upright position and the arm or leg 
was extended and supported by an assistant. A tourniquet applied to prevent any blood escaping from the operative field and uh, with knives and saws the soft tissue and the bones respectively would be divided and the limb removed. This is a what's called a capital knife. It was used, it's an English type of capital knife, perhaps used uh, at the beginning of the war because the knives gradually became straighter as techniques altered. But the point of a curved knife is that you could actually circular, uh, make a circular incision in the limb to divide the skin and muscle and fat and then pull that out of the way so that the saw could be applied to the bone. Having divided the soft tissues, the uh, saw, usually a, a, a tenon saw like this, was used to divide bone. It was described as the most difficult part of the operation because it required a great deal of force on uh, a sort of wet tissue. The bone is rather wet. And uh, the assistant had to steady the limb fairly carefully. And obviously the sawing technique would be largely in one direction only to produce a smoothness of action. But uh, having divided the bone, the operation was, was largely over except for taking out the artery and closing the wound. People who had skull injuries inflicted by a sabre or a, a musket butt or a falling spar in the Navy and had driven bone down, fractured the skull and the fragments were driven into the brain, could be operated on by enlarging the wound a bit by making a circular defect in the skull by using a trephine or a trepan and then access could be gained into the skull and the severity of the injured assessed any missile or debris removed or packed at bits of bone bleeding controlled and then of course there were wounds the, the commonest type of procedure was looking at a wound whether it was caused by a saber or a musket ball and removing musket balls, cleaning up the wound and dressing it. But unfortunately, the biggest failure in surgery uh, was, of course, they didn't understand infection. So the lack of understanding of the manage of wounds caused the unnecessary death of millions of men. There was no pain relief. Quite often, patients fainted during the procedure, both from the thought of the procedure, the pain, and the sight of blood. And this was a, a, a temporary merciful relief, both for surgeon and patient. But um, the thing is that we know from accounts of doctors who had amputations, for instance, without any anesthesia, that it was absolutely ghastly. There was no, nothing that could be as black as that episode. But to have half an hour of that pain, say six weeks of painful recovery with a complication of infection and perhaps another operation, perhaps that was better than dying. I think this war was certainly the last one that was conducted before the advent of steam power and uh, instant communication and high explosive and so forth and, and therefore coupled with the cultural changes, the end of the Age of Enlightenment and all the revolutions, it's an absolutely fascinating period, and it's so important to Britain. And it isn't just the military, it's, it's the forging of a nation. And at the end of the day, so many countries, and even France itself, did not wish for the Napoleonic despotic rule to continue. It, it was wrong, and, and, you know, we've had a part to play in halting that process, uh, much more so in the Second World War, where we stopped another regime from destroying humanity and the enjoyment of living. So I think as we are now in the midst of the bicentennial commemorations of the Peninsula War, and we approach 2015, where surprise reappearance of Napoleon challenged us for the last time, we need to be mindful of the huge sacrifices made by all men who believed they were fighting for the right cause. And I think it's so important that Waterloo 200 and any allied projects uh, take the side of supporting 
a European reshuffle, and I think we should make every effort to commemorate and even celebrate uh, these great events uh, as 2015 approaches.